coming up on the payoff. If you're driving down the road or if you are in some kind of funk wherever you are, whether you're driving down the road or at home or listening to this at your desk, if you need a shot in the arm, this is the podcast for you. Uh, Kevin E., we'll call him, is a coach uh, in life, and he felt like a coach for me today, and hopefully he will for you guys. Uh, He's been sober more than 10 years. His journey in recovery, part of it has been relapse, and uh, his story around that is inspirational, how it happened, how he recovered from it. His family is a big deal here in Central Texas, and we get into that a little bit. Some of their connections go all all the way up, as high as you can go. And uh, some of those connections got Kevin out of trouble for a long time. And eventually, you can't run from this thing anymore, as a lot of us know. And uh, this is a great friend of mine. Uh, He has a great story. And I think it'll be a great time for you if you listen or if you have somebody in your life. um, If you need help with addiction, uh, if you have somebody in your life who needs help with addiction, this uh, this is for you. All right, but first, a gift for you, Kevin Souza. If people know me well, they definitely have heard me bring you up. Uh oh. Yeah, uh, you've given me really good guidance over the course of uh, of my life. It was so good, actually. I stopped using it. That's a- <laughs> It was so good. I figured I'd stop asking, like like a good alcoholic. Exactly. Uh, so I want to start with you. <clears throat> when was the first time you had a drink? Wow. First time would have been probably in the sixth grade. I was at a wedding reception. Um, I believe it was good old West Fraternal out in West, and of course they West had Texas. West Texas, and which fa- is which is a city in Texas, not West, West Texas. West yeah. West, the city of West. Okay. Good old country wedding, and I was at that age where girls were wanting to dance, and I wasn't that confident in my dance, and somehow uh, a plastic cup ended up in my hand, took a drink, probably took another, and then I became the best dancer (laughs) in my mind. So immediately, I connected drink, no fear, drink, good dancer, drink, girls likey, and so um, it kind of, you know, I was a duck before the drink, and then when I took a drink, I became an eagle. And so that, that disease of perception began um, that, that early on. Were you uh, like exposed to alcoholism in your family or anything? Is it in your, your family history, your family origin? I believe the first time I heard the actual word alcoholic was in reference to my mom's, um, my grandmother on my mom's side, her husband, who I never met. All I knew about him was cool. He worked for the CIA, I heard that but he was a raging alcoholic and how bad he treated granny. We never met him. That was my first um, exposure to the word alcoholic. That it, was, it was connected with bad and sick and mean. Um, but other than that, no, my father, we, I mean, we had alcohol in our house. We had alcohol at social events, but nothing I ever connected to um, any type of, of alcoholism. It's so weird. <laughs> like when I was a kid, my mom... The first time I heard alcoholic was she talked to me about my father, who was a functional alcoholic, but she would say, you know, I, I, I would, I believe looking back now, and this is just my perception of it, that there would be like a bad night, I think, and she would tell me the next morning, like your father, you know, needs to stop drinking. And as a kid, you just really, I couldn't make the connect, the, the connection. Um, and, and looking back now, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's hard to even imagine what my mom was going through, you know, all that. But, uh, yeah, it's weird when you hear about that as a kid. Well, one other connection, I remember when uh, my my grandfather um, moved. We, be, we built him a house after my grandmother passed away later in life. Um, out by the, it was a pool house. We converted to a place where he could live versus going to a home. And I remember you know, he was, I think he had drank a little too much um, on re- repeat occasions. And my dad really got on to him. Like, and he cut it out. So I think I connected with, if it gets bad enough, just stop, right? Yeah. Given a sufficient reason, just stop. And so I never made that connection because, you know, the alcoholic life seems like the normal one when we're in it. Like all the angst, all the anxiety, all the fear that's drowned away. That just seems like the normal life. And so, what, what did it enable you to do? Like alcohol, like as a plus, you mentioned you were an eagle. How did it turn you into an eagle? Yeah, like I'm, I'm a pretty, 
as you know, outgoing person. Yeah. And so I don't need alcohol to be that way today. I just think early on, like, there was this, um, I, I tell people all the time, like, every time I would have an issue with drinking, they would say, why are you drinking? Just be yourself. A lot, in every different arena, I was a little bit version of a self that I thought people wanted me to be. Um, so I was on stage performing the whole time. So over time, I felt the alcohol gave me that that juice necessary um, to be the, the the Kevin that they wanted me to be. My greatest fear was all those people being in the same room. And then what was I going to do, right? So um, I think that um, alcohol it turned me into that wing because it, it, gave me, it gave me wings. It gave me wings later on. It kind of uh, it helped me fly, I always say, and later on it kind of took away the sky uh, in my life. Yeah, I, I nailed me to fly, and I flew too close to the sun. Yeah. And then it was a wrap. You talked a little bit about – you know, that juice you got from, from drinking. Before we started here, you mentioned that people that work for you, you say. Every employee, what do you say? Every employee that I hire, they get to talk, and I let them know that you got to bring the juice. Whether you're coaching, you're a recruiter, and you got to bring the juice. And I tell them, if you're juiceful, you're useful. If you're juiceless, you're useless. And that's a cool thing to say at work. And what I found, the, the, uh, the connection with recovery, recovery, um, my relationship with God, that's that's the juice that I that's have today. That's the juice it, for, it, for it, me too. And yeah. it makes me useful, right? And when I don't have that juice, not drinking again, but when I'm away from the tools um, of recovery um, that have helped me, that give me that juice, when I'm away, I'm not as useful. I'm actually useless. So I have to fill up on that juice. And for me, that is a uh, conscious contact, a daily connection with, with God and with the people, fellowship with the spirit and, and also the spirit of the fellowship, people in recovery. You you mentioned like it's so cool that and it's so hard to get get across to somebody who's coming coming in or you know to sobriety the, the the stuff you get from alcohol is the stuff you get from sobriety the juice is is you can still have that you know I was saying the other night on a meeting I used to lie about things that I'm able to do now I would sit on a bar stool and lie about you know, whatever, I have this job or I, I, I was with this girl or whatever. Um, and now I'm able to accomplish like, you know, things in my life and show up for people. And it's just the juice is, is, is authentic and it's real and it's natural if you tap into it. Absolutely. And I know I'm being taped and on camera, so hate, <laughs> hate admitting this, but there were times in my life when the truth would have been sufficient and just as easy as telling a lie. But sometimes I would gravitate toward the lie or the embellishment um, because I wasn't comfortable being who I am doing what I'm doing with whom I'm doing it with. And 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 thankfully, uh, recovery has given me that. It's, it's a more than sufficient substitute for what alcohol provided. I remember a sponsor of mine when I was living in a halfway house, he told me, and this made me feel so good, because he said, in passing, he'd been around for a while, but he said, you know, I still, I'll still blow up stories once in a while. He was talking about when he was spiritually unfit. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Like, these people aren't saints. You know, you can get sober. You could still make missteps, and you could talk about it. Yeah, you know. Um, all right, so back to you. Uh, uh, enough of me. Back to you. You you go in the high. You go from sixth grade on. How does it develop? How, how do you start wow. to use alcohol? You know, I, I often reflect on this because you hear stories of someone had a really bad night, a really bad weekend, and they all their world blew up, and they either were incarcerated and got in the program. You know, at sixth grade, I didn't drink progressively. Like, it was off and on at weddings, um, in high school, um, did not progress. Because I was actively involved in sports. I was a valedictorian. So I was... I was so in, in high school, you kind of kept it I, I was, I was, I was into my academics. I was into athletics. I grew up with a great family. Yes, they were divorced. It has nothing to do with my alcoholism. Um, but I, I grew up in a great family. I didn't want for anything. I think, or I, looking back, noticed in, in high school... Um, in my probably my senior year, um, wasn't really a fulfilling athletic um, um, year, and so on the weekends we'd go to, the, to Waco and, and drink and cruise the valley, and so that just seemed like the normal thing to do. Uh, occasionally it was a fist fight, occasionally there was a wrecked vehicle, but um, thank you, Dad. He would just write a check, and I would you know get a new vehicle and get out of trouble, and that. I didn't realize at the time, but pushing that that bottom, it had nothing to do with my external circumstances, but the internal condition of alcoholism, it kept pushing the, the bottom that I needed to turn it around. And so I drank off and on in high school, college. Um, I was valedictorian, so I had a 4.0 my 
fall semester and doing all the right things. Broke up with the old high school girlfriend, discovered what pledging a fraternity was all about, and it was off to the races. So <laughs> my uh, end of my freshman year, I, I really um, – in got college. into my research and development on <laughs> excessive drinking. Yeah, I really did. So you mentioned uh, about, you know, your family and your father being able to bail you out of trouble. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with our family circumstances, but because I don't think they know any better. But like you said, that bottom keeps getting pushed off and pushed off. Was there a sense of, uh, you know, entitlement, not entitlement, but, you know, you, uh, you're unbeatable? Yes, there, there was. So for both my brother and I, um, my father had um, money influence, and so we would get in trouble. And People knew like, who you were around. Knew town. who we were. There was, uh, you know, district judges that deer hunted on the the land, and so they would, you know, give great counsel and advice. And I would see that um, later on. Later on in life, um, you know, uh, my dad's connection with um, it was the president at the time, and I'd see my brother get out of trouble and. So yeah, I always the associate president it's, uh, 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 of the United States. Yes, and so I'd, <laughs> I'd see, I would see, okay, around all these people, and um, I think it was less to do with who they were, but my dad just had this an abundance of love, and he thought he was doing the right thing. I've done the same thing sure. with family, and think that bailing them out or or um, removing a consequence is actually helping. They'll learn the lesson, and that's a rational response. The, the reality is we're not dealing with a, with, a, with a disease of rationality. And so, yeah, there was a sense of entitlement, sense of the rules don't apply. I can admit that. Um, and I'm happy to report that that's not the case today. <laughs> <laughs> you, you talk, <laughs> that's not you, the case you, today. You talk about, uh, you know, people don't know how to deal with this. There's no playbook for this, for the family or for the person that's, you know, the victim to this or, or the person that's the alcoholic, not necessarily a victim. But uh, that's why we do, that's why this is kind of cool because people listen to this who aren't alcoholic, but they don't know what to do with their kids. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's just good to give people a, a window inside of our experience, strength and hope, right? Because your dad got you out of a lot of trouble and it didn't make you any better. No. You know? I, I would argue worse. At the time, I'm sure I was extremely grateful and 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 lucky. Man, I got out of trouble that time. Knowing what I know about recovery day and for anyone listening, um, I, I think that you gotta love them enough to let them walk through the consequences. You have to love them enough um, to, um, to, to learn from, from those mistakes. Removing the consequences with, with the drinking and the drinking or the using such a small part of disease, quite honestly, um, it, it puts off the, the, the recovery process. It did, it did for me personally. What were some of the bigger consequences you had throughout college? And um, so wrecks wrecking tons of vehicles um getting in getting in fight so i had to get out of legal trouble with you know a fist fight here or there um and just and just a lot of vehicle wrecks and and then for me um it, it, over time it was just my nowhere knows and it was just that incredibly growing your nowhere knows your nowhere knows and just knowing that this is not how i want to live like i when i realized that it wasn't just, oh, you know, just in the wrong place, wrong time and drinking and whatever. When I realized it was a problem, it was when I drank, when I didn't want, I drank against my will. Like, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be, you know, that disappointment. Um, the, the turning point for me when I got into recovery um, is I had been on uh, kind of a three-day, you know, just going out all the time. And my, I went home, I was so depressed. And you know how we do, like, oh, I don't want to live here anymore. Just trying to play the emotional card. <laughs> And my dad just shook his head and said, you're the biggest disappointment in my life. And I thought, you know, I had a brother that was having issues. I was never that kid. I was the good brother. And it was, it just cut me to the core. Um, I, I say this all the time. My turning point was essentially God gave me a glimpse uh, in a very uh, insane moment to have just enough sanity to see how my life was, was out of control. And something had to be different. And so I cried out for help. Um, not specifically to anyone, but just just help. And then um, I, I entered treatment two days later, and then here I am on the couch with uh, <laughs> the payoff with Pete today. Um, I but promise it, 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 it gets uh, better. I promise. But the, the, the crazy thing about um, the disease, th it was bad enough 10, 20, 50 times before that moment. It was bad enough um, if you're outside looking in saying, God, Kevin, you got everything going for you. All these people who love and care about you, it's time to change. And the reality is, I won't sing the song, but I was dying inside and 
no one knew it but me. And so it was just eating away um, at uh, any any sense of strength to just turn it around on my own. And and thankfully, um, I got got to the end of I got to my bottom internally, and and cried out for help. And um, as I said, the the substitute I have today for what alcohol gave me is abundantly, um, uh, profoundly, so much better. What were your relationships like with women in, in, in your drinking? I mean, how did you use alcohol to facilitate those relationships? <laughs> I didn't know we were going there today. And, and, uh, and okay, so, um, as I mentioned, it started at an early age. Drink, good dancer. Because for me, and, that was, for me, that was oh. and you know this just from, from working with me and, and recovery. Alcohol was my conduit to any sort of relationship with a woman. Yes. I, I didn't, you know, I never, I didn't, my mom was extremely important to me in my upbringing, but that's about it. As far as women, I didn't have sisters. I didn't just know how to, everything I learned about women were from guys who knew nothing about women. Absolutely. That's well said. But Absolutely. I heard it stole it from somebody else. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I would say it was that um, great social lubricant that we read about in recovery that when I was with a girl going out or a date, it, I, it was always drinking. So I associated that um, that confidence and that uh, that suave and debonair um, um, persona with we're drinking. It was I just had this thought when you're sharing that. I remember in treatment um, they were doing our discharge program, make sure we're ready to go out into the real world. And I'm like on fire and I got this down. Let's go go go. And they do a little exercise. And I remember um, Dr. Brown standing behind me and saying, "Okay, you're out. You're driving around. You're at the lake. Great. And you get stopped." Two females, extremely good looking. They're tan, they're this, they're that. And they want to have a, a drink. What do you do? And it hit me. <laughs> it's like, I guess the pause said it all. Oh, yeah. Because she busted me. And it was like, I had associated that uh, acceptance and um, that sense of, of confidence as it relates to women with, with alcohol. And so um, I had it, to really overcome that. It takes a long, long time to undo that. I mean... Uh, there's a guy who uh, who we see in recovery once in a while who says this program isn't so much about getting stuff as it is about getting rid of stuff in Amen. sobriety. I mean, I had to get rid of, still I'm unloading stuff, you know, the fear, the insecurity uh, around women was so great when I got sober that it took me a long time. I'm happy I, I waited. I, I, I mean, I remember one time I was talking to a guy about this who was sort of newly sober recently. I was, I was probably a year and a half, maybe two years sober. I was looking through my phone and I was like, I don't have like one text with a female going on <laughs> here where like something's happening. And, uh, and I was like, am I never going to get this? Am I never going to get there? And you, you eventually do. And it's such a huge accomplishment. It's such alcohol is just such a huge lie that tells you all these things uh, that aren't obviously are not true. You know, um, so you get into so you are bottoming out, right? The moment your, your dad says you're a huge disappointment. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you go into treatment. I go to treatment. And and what I want to get to part of your story is there's a there's like a window of of like a relapse in there. Yeah. And and I think that that's really important because a lot of people don't understand that that's kind of part of the deal sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so you get sober, but what do you start to do? What changes are you making in your life to sustain sobriety and and to fill that? For me, it's just like I still have it like that hole. Yeah. In our soul. So, so what I learned, and I, I thought probably like a lot of people think that if you are an alcoholic, have an issue with drinking, you have a drinking problem. That drinking's your problem. That's what I believe. What I learned in recovery, drinking wasn't my problem. Drinking was my solution. So the root cause of my alcoholism is not I drink too much. Um, it's uh, it's selfishness and self centeredness. So when I was in recovery and got out, uh, my grandfather had got real old and real sick quick. And my dad had just um, been diagnosed with, with cancer. And so he was receiving radiation and chemotherapy. My grandpa was really sick. I, I lived with my, they lived real close. And so I moved in with my grandpa. And um, what helped me the most is I had to, to do things I was never equipped to do. Bathe him, give him medicine, shower him, this is early serve in him. Sobriety. Early in sobriety. And so what it did was it forced me. I'd like to say I nobly got out of self. No, it forced me out of self to be of service. And what it did was, by getting out of self, it freed up just enough space for God's grace, his mercy, and purpose to work in and through me. And that was enough. Like, that was for, for two years. And, you know, um, and then um, what happened was 
I was being a service, and that's a very important part of recovery, but I, I, I was kind of comfortably miserable. I talk about I had done just enough of the work, just enough of the steps to make the, uh, the situation better, to make the pain of circumstance kind of be pushed back, but it hadn't been removed. It was just pushed back. And this disease is powerful, it's cunning, it's baffling, it's patient. And so while I was being of service and doing all the right things, and everyone's like, Kevin's doing so good, and I got my stuff back, and everything was great. Um, and then, but I wasn't, I didn't finish the work. I didn't finish the steps. And so slowly but surely, even in the rooms of recovery, my alcoholism grew worse. And I can say that now because looking back, I didn't know that. I thought, you know, maybe I'm the, ex- again, exceptionalism. Maybe I'm the exception. I've done just enough work. I'm not drinking. I'm so going you, to work. You, you get away from recovery. Yeah. So you're kind of like. I, no, I'm, I'm going to meetings. Okay. I'm going to meetings. I'm elected GSR. I'm yeah. speaking eloquent meetings. I'm sharing little tidbits, but I wasn't doing the work. And if you. What's the work? God, God rewards honest effort, not wishful thinking. The work for my sobriety is the steps. I mm-hmm. had to work the steps. And it was a, you mentioned it. And so it was uh, growing in relationship with, my, with, with God and, and, and learning more. And I think that learning more is getting more. It was unlearning. It, it's not the things I didn't know that was killing me. It was the things that I swore were absolutely true that just ain't so. That was what was holding me back. So um, my grandfather passed away. Uh, I, I'll say this. My dad saying I was a disappointment and taking my grandpa. I, I may be fast forwarding too much, but I had the great privilege. The greatest sobriety has given me so many rewards. But I held my grandfather's hand as a hospice no- nurse is singing, um, when we've been there 10,000. She's singing Amazing Grace. I'm holding my grandpa's and he looks up at me. Pete, I cannot describe the, the pride, the love, the forgiveness, because I've been taking care of him. They, they saw me as a disappointment then. I held his hand as he took his last breath on earth. And I did the same thing for my father four years after that. So he was, he was in a hospital room and he looked at me and um, no matter how the, 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 the road to get to recovery and to, um, to have the, this freedom from bondage, that look in my father's eyes is something no one can ever take away. It was, it restored everything. And I owe all that all to the, to the program and, and, and to recovery. So. And I would imagine that that stays with you today because you talked about, you know, when we pull that card, the emotional card, like, I don't want to live here anymore. Or, I don't want to live anymore or whatever. And it leads up to that moment where your dad says you're disappointment. For me, like I'm like in shambles as a person up to that moment. I don't have any more self-esteem. Yes. And what you just mentioned, those two instances, they build, they naturally build that self-esteem. Like by doing the right things, you build that self-esteem. You know, uh, like I, I, I always say, I tell tell sponsors I work with, if you want to um, increase your self-esteem do esteemable things. It's really yeah. that simple. And if you do things that aren't esteemable, like last, uh, two nights ago, I was lying to my girlfriend, you know? Um, unesteemable. And, uh, you know, I say it's not a major deal. It's a white lie, but I'm lying. And it's like, you know, like, she calls me on it. I admit it. Uh, and you feel like S-H-I-T. Yeah. And, 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 and it's the next day, there's a hangover. It's hard to get out of bed almost. And you're just like, man, I feel like crap. And that... You stack enough of those chips on top of each other, and it's enough to get drunk. Yeah, you know. And and that was that similar. You can you can lie to yourself in the program. I'm a sober member of this program, this fellowship. If I'm not finishing the work, if I'm not uh, living an authentic life, it, it won't be a night out at the club. It won't be they showed up and offered you something. It's not the bears that chases out of the woods. It's the mosquitoes. So it's over time those little bit that little small lie that little that embellishment over time. If you're an alcoholic, um, the disease is patient, and it will reach out and, and grab you when you're not ready. And um, so I had four and a half years of sobriety, and I gave, I'm sure, with, with what was a very eloquent and moving speech, I got my four and a half year chip, and I had gotten in shape and got the job back and the vehicle back. So I left that meeting, and I went and met this little cute brunette at the Elite Cafe on the Circle, and she ordered and. Ordered a, a pint of beer, and I said, I'll have a water. I'm Did you meet drink. her on, like, a dating app? So yeah. she doesn't no, know No, no, no. She, she does not know about my past. Okay. She was introduced to me. I was teaching at the time. My principal and his wife thought a lot of me, and they saw I took care of my grandfather. Right? I'm living the great life, four years sober. And it, it, I knew she knew of me from middle school through U, UIL and athletics. 
I was a big deal, Pete. Yeah. But, um, hey, you still and, are. And so my, my UIL pres- is the Texas, basically the governing body over high school athletics, right, yeah. in Texas? Yes. Yeah. And so she knew of me, so they introduced us, and um, we, we, we went out. I met her at Starbucks. We went out. But we were having our big first day at the Elite. Sure. So she orders a beer. I say water. So she's not drinking? No, not tonight. Because I haven't, haven't been honest, right? Yeah. I went honest with her. I came back. Well, there was a beer there. She, I thought you might want one. I wish I could report that <laughs> four and a half years of – you know, even going to meetings and doing this, but not doing the work. I put up a big fight. No, I said, thank you and drank it. And the worst thing happened to me that night. When I went home, I didn't get pulled over. When I went home, I didn't have a wreck. I met the girl, got the kiss. And I thought, huh, maybe I'm not an alcoholic, right? There's a disease again. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm different. Maybe uh, I had a mental defense. I said no the first time. The next time they brought the beer, I did it. And so, um, what happened, nothing bad happened. And so for then in about two months of going out, it just got, it picked up. So you up were back it. out for two months? Yeah, for, I was out for five months. Okay. And I met my sponsor today and um, he said, hey, we, we miss you. I haven't been going to meetings and this, that, and the other. And I said, well. So you met up with him? Yeah, I met I met up with him and I said. The, did you tell him you're drinking? Yes, I said, I said, you know, I probably need to get back in there before people find out. I need to make make a you know an amends. And he said, oh, People know, <laughs> and that crushed me because then yeah. I thought I was living this that life. We think we got everyone at bay, and no one knows, and and so it was very humbling. And so I did the very not honorable thing. I went to a meeting, um, not my home group. Uh-huh. I went to a meeting, um, and the, the funny thing was, I woke up that night, and I heard on the TV, USA, you everybody with these parades, the city in the, in city streets, and I thought, man, everybody's really excited about Kevin's coming back <laughs> to the program. It was a night um, that we killed Bin Laden. Okay. And so that was on the news. It was playing that night. So and I was like, wow, I can't even get, I'm going to come back in and make this big so Kevin's May back. 2010. Yeah, right? it, was, it was 2011. Uh, um, 11. Okay. 11. Yeah, May, May 1st. Yep, May yep. 1st. Okay. And so I went to a, a different meeting and I'm sitting there and it's the meeting where you give your name and you say your date. I'm like, oh man. So I said my new date and you're supposed to be so forgiving and non judgmental in the program. Well, rest assured. Um, it's not Wells People's Anonymous. So <laughs> I said my date, and everybody looked, and I was like, just crushed. And I was like, I'm getting out of here. And um, there's a lady in the program. Her name is Anna, if I may say oh, her yeah, name. Oh, yeah. And Anna. Anna's she, been a guest. She here. walked over to me and gave me the biggest hug and said, welcome home. And I was just like, I was like, thank you. And so my, my journey began. And I remember I got my six-month chip on, on round two, and I was feeling really despondent about that. Ah, six months, I should have had five years. And my sponsor said, you know, Bill Wilson, he only had six months when he started this whole thing. That's a pretty symbolic, significant amount of time. And you obviously that, are yeah. different. And so I just made the decision. Uh, I got a, as you know, at that time, hardcore, big book thumping, um, black belt sponsor. <laughs> and I, it was just, it was what I needed. Yeah. It, it was, it was, it was more ego deflation. And, and we're going to do the work. And, and I'd had him before I went back out and I thought he was going to, I told you so. And, this, that, and the other. And he he said, hey, you know, obviously you learned some things. You did some things right. You have four years or four and a half years. Let's do it right. Let's do it the whole way this time. And I did. And it's been, you know, almost 11 years ago. You mentioned ego deflation, right? And you've got a big personality. You come from a successful family. You're a successful guy. How have you been able to maintain that ego deflation? Wipe your wipe your mouth off. All right, thank you, Pete. <laughs> I'm drooling all this good stuff here. <laughs> what was the question? So your ego deflation, because I mean, I, I want to. You mentioned your 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 father, a relationship with the president. You know, like the, you're you're out there on this ranch. It's like uh, Westwood out there. What, what do they call? What's that? What's that? Show? Western White House. Oh, well, uh, um, well, Yellowstone. West, yeah, it's like Yellowstone. Yellowstone, but yeah, Western White House, right? That's yeah. what they called it. Um, you're out there, kind of say Crawford, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So you're big, out, big city boy. You're, yeah, but but you the land that the president purchased for his, you know, what would you call it, the Western White House was yeah. from your family. Yes. Yeah. It was. So he's kind of living close to you. You're untouchable uh, for certain situations when you're drinking. How do you, how do you deflate that ego on a, on a daily basis? Because you're from a situation where you're in pretty good shape, you know. Um. I remember talking to someone my, my whole life. It was, you know, 
I, I used to think it was because of me. I learned life is sometimes inspired of me, but just everything you touch turned to go like this Midas effect of academics, athletics. I was just rolling, rolling, rolling. Born on third base, thought I had a triple. Exactly. That's, what I heard That's a I'd like that. Yeah. And um, when I say ego deflation is not not just um, I uh, think less about me. I don't think about me so much. Um, I've I've learned that um, my sobriety is not dependent upon. Um, anything I know about the program, it's all dependent on what I do in the program. And so I learned that I used to hear the phrase, another, another bozo on the bus or just another. I, I, and previously, I would think, well, that's, I, I don't subscribe to that theory. I need to be. And I've really, um, the humility, um, the degree of selflessness that working the steps and going through recovery has granted me, um, I, I can't. It's almost like a selfless response to say, it's not anything that I've learned that I do or I've done to learn how to be more humble. It's by doing the work that God has empowered me um, with a degree of selflessness and um, and, and service um, that's almost kind of uncomfortable to talk about. In the past, it wouldn't be uncomfortable to talk about. I'd say, well, I do this. It's, it's not. <laughs> it's nothing to do with me. It's yeah. um, I grow in relationship with my creator each and every day. By, by suiting up and showing up and, and realize that um, uh, we all have a part to play that he assigns, and I do my best to, um, to, to carry that role. There's no one in my life, like this is probably a little uncomfortable, there's no one in my life, um, and that's intentional, that doesn't know that you know, I have an a involvement with recovery because um, it's a very important part of, part of my you, life. You're sort of similar to, to myself in a sense where if, to get to know me is to know that I'm in recovery. Yeah. I don't walk up to you at HEB and, and hit you over the head with a big book or, you know, if we're, I just have a conversation or I meet somebody. But if we're going to have a real conversation, it's going to come up because as a guy said once, I heard him say at a meeting, you know, when I'm at the 7-Eleven, you know, I'm the guy in recovery. Like that's, you know, like that's who I am. It needs to be that way. I need to be Dan who is sober uh, because that's, that's who I just, I need to be. That's who I am. Alcoholism mm. and drugs completely encompass my whole life, right? So why recovery has to now? Yeah. Well, because I'm, I'm unhealthy otherwise. Uh, the, car, the compartmentalization of my recovery the first time around, I believe wholeheartedly, led to me being in a situation that I went back out in. And I will never, ever take that risk again. Um, you know, my wife, the, 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 the crazy brunette. things, the brunette that night, that's my wife today. <laughs> And so she is. She knows as much of the program as people in the program because it's an important part of our our marriage. It's made our marriage better. Um, people at work know. Like you said, I don't beat them over the head, and that's not part of the interview process. But they either pick up on it or know. And the really cool thing is when some of these young people that I'm that I lead are struggling, or they know someone, um, they will bring them to me in a in a meaningful way. And I've had the 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 privilege uh, and honor of of helping people in their own journey. Like um, me. Yeah. Well, well, no, I want to, and I want to kind of go back to what you <clears> said about meeting your wife. You know, I had a situation, a, a couple where I would be dating a, a woman and I would talk to you about it. And I remember I was like, you know, I'm going to see this girl and I'm terrified and yada, yada. And you're like, yeah, like you're probably going to show up and she's going to just walk to the door and call you a huge loser. <laughs> and they'll have a lot of people with the camera shouting asshole yeah. ass, you know, that's not what happens, but that's how we catastrophize, right? Uh, and you really helped me through a couple of relationships um, just to kind of navigate the waters because I didn't have a clue. I did not know what to do. I didn't, I didn't understand it. I hadn't experienced it. You shared your experience with me. But the one thing I want to ask, I want to ask you a tough question because I used to resent you a little bit, and here's why. I used to say, Kevin got to drink when he met his wife. And he got to ease, you got to ease through all that stuff. I said, okay. relationships and sobriety are hard. You know, but what was it like when you have, I can only imagine it was a lot harder when you had to get sober uh, and you're dating this woman. How did you walk that tightrope? There's a great line in, in our beautiful big book that says our behavior will convince them more than our words. In, the, in my past life, I always relied on um, the, silver the power of my words. I convinced. And so um, she saw the when I, I had to tell her that I'd had. I didn't even tell her while I was drinking the first month that I had been in recovery <laughs> before. How awful is that? that so I was like, right, she's an amazing person. I thought, am I going to lose her? But a sponsor, like, you got to be honest. So I was honest. And from day one, um, she's like, I need to take all the liquor out of our house. Because she, she 
drinks, you know, a glass of wine once every two years. And um, she has been the most supportive person in, in my recovery because it allows me a place of refuge to come home. And, and there's, there's no dishonesty in our home. So uh, that, that, that acceptance, that support is what I needed. It kickstart my recovery and gave me the confidence over time to make sure I'm that way with everyone uh, in, in my different, in my circle. How are, how do you stay that way? Because you, you through your work, you, you interact with a lot of human beings on a daily basis, which sometimes I, I will fear, but when I do it, it usually works out, right? But I have this, like you said, like you could, I catastrophize. And sometimes I can even leave the person better than when, you know, I, I encountered them. You do that a lot with your work. How do you continue to do that? And do you, do you see how you do that? Uh, you know, all like you work with younger people. Um, how do you see the tenants of the program affecting you know their life? It's it's amazing. It kind of comes in one. full circle to how we started. If you're juiceful, you're useful. If you're juiceless, you're useless. So for me, I got to start that day right. Like I do have a great honor to be able to be of service in a lot of different areas at work uh, and 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 outside of work recovery. And so I'm always pouring into the lives of others, but you have to fill that cup. And so for me, it starts with um, uh, a continued growing relationship um, with my, with God for me and able to, to share that. Um, you know, I like to introduce God to other people. Um, and oftentimes words aren't necessary. And so it's through um, just that, that selfish, selfless um, act of service. Um, God keeps putting those things in my path. Like I was, I'm an old special ed teacher, and I remember regret when I came to work. Um, my current employer, I was like, "Yeah, but I'm gonna miss those kids." Well, it was two months later that we had this great partnership with this organization that provides athletic you can say it. Can you no say limitations. And you, so it's on your jacket. So I'm gonna yeah, say it. So yeah. D1, because I was about to get here. Yeah. This is, oh, sorry. <laughs> this is um, this is unbelievable. You guys, you mentioned you were a special ed teacher. Mm -hmm. You're sober now. You're running this place, and you connect with no limitations which gives special needs kids, right? Yes. Uh, the opportunity to play sports and be celebrated. Amazing organization. At your amazing facility, you guys hold it. Here's how it started. So um, I'm, I'm on the job for a month, and I get hit on Facebook, tagged, or they shared my name. Someone was looking for a place to hold their prom. And this lady that where I used to coach said, well, contact Kevin Ingebrecht he, at D1. I think they have room. And I'm like, you okay. guys have basically it's like a giant warehouse that has been outfitted yes. to be like this athletic palace and, and, and at state of the art athletic facility, fully turf field. And um, so they came by and they looked it over and they brought some kids with them. They were in their wheelchairs and they were like, huh, no, not sure about prom. They'd found another spot, but we run a football league. And I was like, really, where are you playing? And they were they were playing this, this great place the church had provided, but it was kind of a gym floor and it wasn't. It wasn't D1, like this amazing <laughs> state of the art. I'm like, come on. It's and got so, a stadium dome feel uh, to it when you walk I, in. I remember at the time that summer I was running a softball camp, and I told the people working the camp that in the past we've uh, – I told the kids, we have filled your uh, shelves with trophies, your closets with T-shirts. We're going to fill your heart up. So we brought the No Limitation athletes out there, and they get to be part of the camp. And from the adults to the kids, it was this amazing experience. We didn't want to end. So we started our first football season, and I said to the founder, what do you do after the regular season? They play like four weeks, and they said, we quit playing. And I thought, you know, you're juiceful, you're useful. So I said, we can do better than that. We had a Super Bowl, and that was – Still do. Great. Still do. We had our fifth Super Bowl this year, and it gives us the opportunity for other organizations because some of these kids are in wheelchairs or can't run. They, they buddy up, and they partner, and they get to be of service. And so it's just – here's this theme again. As long as you are – um, uh, of, of service and free yourself of self, um, God can really work some really cool things in your life in recovery and, and in service. And that's, uh, we're very privileged to do that. It's been, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. I've had a chance to be a part of it and just see that the, the, the look in their eyes and, uh, you know, these kids. And I think about, you know, you've, you've just shared with me before, like, it's just, it's for you to be able to do um, that. We, we give them t-shirts and ring and medals at the end. And all the planning and all the sacrifice and moving stuff around is worth it. When you take that, uh, when you take that um, medal and you put it over their their heads, I'm telling you, you can see into their soul, not just their eyes. And they may have difficulty communicating, not in that moment, 
there is so much um, uh, just love in that moment, and they they feel. I had a uh, we forget it's for the kids. It's also for the parents. I had a big six foot four guy want to talk to me. You run this place. I thought who could complain on a day like today? And he was like, <laughs> Let me tell you something. You keep saying this is for the kids. Let me tell you something. When my kid was diagnosed with this disability, we it it shook my core. Didn't think I'd ever have an opportunity to do sports or coach or go to their stuff. And he has siblings that are you know not they don't have disability and non disabled and said uh, they were jealous of him today. And he just broke down. So you have no idea how much that means to this family. And so that's the really cool stuff that, you know, you can flash it back real rapid timeline. If without recovery, none of that's that's possible. Um, not without um, a daily commitment to growing in my relationship with God, none of that's possible. Which has affected thousands, tens of thousands of people now oh. from this program. Through, I mean, and that's just one of the many ways. When you have somebody that comes in to recovery, and they're, they they ask you, um, or, or what would you tell them when they say, how, how do I how do I just get a day? I'm just trying to get a day. What, what do I what do I do, Kevin? Well, first of all, I would say, are you done? Right? You want to make sure you're done, um, and then I want to make sure that. Oftentimes, we kind of wait for them to come to us, but once someone reaches out to me, then that's my responsibility, right? Um, that when someone reaches out. Um, I'm going to be there to help them. So we're going to we're going to get to a meeting if we if they it depends on you know they are they vibrating in the moment we're going to, they they need detox so it depends on the situation um, so it may include detox or ER or whatever the situation may be sometimes oftentimes um, treatment centers have done so so much of the work today and so they get to us a little bit later where they kind of are just trying to figure it out so I'm going to sit down and spend some time with them and we're going to um, see if they're if they're done we're going to see if, what they've tried. Uh, and what they're willing to do now. If they if they are fully conceited um, that they don't have the answers or they're alcoholic and they and they're looking for a, a new design for living and a, and a way out, um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna share with them my experience, my strength, and my hope. I'm not gonna lecture. Not gonna look at their life. I'm just gonna share them. Um, for me, and you know, this is a program of attraction. Kind of share what the program's done for me. And um, and if they're willing to go on any link, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk them through the program step by step, and we're gonna we're gonna get down to get down to work because it's a program of action. A C T I O N action. Any choice to improve our nature. Our nature, my nature, was selfish and self centeredness. So the program for me got me out of self, um, and I'm gonna share that, and I'm gonna help them kind of do the same thing. Have there been times in your recovery outside of the relapse after four and a half years where you felt disconnected? Um, so I remember the the lockdown affected a lot of people oh, yeah. in recovery. And um, I was fortunate. Um, I was so, in my industry, that was a very scary time. So we were locked down. I was helping other facilities that had just opened up, and I was going 100 miles an hour, drinking four to six bang energy drinks a day <laughs> and going, going, going. And, and I'm not drinking, and I'm not drinking. And then my, uh, my sponsor's like, you need to, he, you know, that's why you surround yourself. Um, stick with the winners. You surround yourself with people in recovery. And he's like, you know, we need it. So I, I made a conscious decision that I wasn't finished with the work. You know, I'd got nine years of sobriety at the time. And I am I went back through the work again. And we went back, back through the steps, back through the work. And I learned that there was some amends I had to make that I hadn't made. And it was just this amazing process of a whole deeper level. You can all, there's always more. The spiritual beginning has a beginning, but it has no end. And so we just went further and deeper. And I'm eternally grateful um, to my sponsor for that. Um, that was a that was a tough time when you can't get the meetings. Um, but you 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 have a real busy life to begin with, so yeah. uh, you know you still do a good job of making it a, a priority. You're all over Texas and, and different parts of the country with this ever expanding. Someone told me a long time ago: many meetings, many chances; few meetings, few chances; no meetings, no chance. And I don't want to communicate that that. Just oh, no, don't, just drink. don't tell this no, guy. That just don't drink make it. and just go to meetings. Yeah, no, to there's a whole <laughs> level of worse. Because the reality is, meeting makers that just make meetings and don't work the full program, um, they drink again. They kill themselves again. That's just a fact. It's not my opinion. And so um, <laughs> it's a very important part. And I make yeah. a conscious effort to be there because that's the, that's the locker room, right? That's that's the locker room at halftime. No matter what's going on before, what the score may be before, what lies ahead in the second half, that's the locker room. And that, that recharges and energizes. Very essential part. I make as many meetings as anyone, I, I just, as, as I can. 
a uh, very important part. But I'm telling you, I know from personal experience, if you don't finish the work, that alcoholism is out there waiting. It's doing push-ups and pull-ups and just waiting for you to think you got it. You're an exception. You're different. You don't need to finish the work. It's waiting. It was waiting for me. And, you know, thankfully God and loving people in the program love me back in. And um, I, I do do all the work as it's prescribed today. How did you allow yourself to be open to that criticism? Because um, I'm told that, that I struggle with that. Like, you know, people kind of tell me exactly. You surround yourself with truth tellers, right? That's a lot of times what we get um, in in recovery. How did you respond to that, uh, or how did you become open to responding? Like when you get told, "Hey, you need to you need to get your ass back back to work." Initially, I didn't respond. I reacted. And what I've discovered in recovery, the <laughs> stimulus and the space involved if it's if it's here to here, stimulus reaction, not much space. It's not good. If I if I am spiritually connected, I'm doing the work, there's more space to respond to principles. Um, in the response, that's a great thing. I did not respond great the first time, but I prayed about it. And the person that spoke truth into my life is someone that I respect incredibly a, a, a lot. And so I received it and got back to work. And you know, the great thing about our recovery, it's, it's great when times are great and you're this great person, but it's designed that we were, like I said earlier, this ain't Wells People Anonymous. <laughs> so you're dealing with people that are, you know, have issues. I'm one of them. And so um, it's a program that's designed when you kind of get off the beam. And I should think that phrase in recovery, get off the beam, was like a balance beam, like you fall off. That's not the rigid, that's not where it came from. It came from like the beam of like a beam of light, like the, uh, um, like a, a, a beam that, that gets aircraft straightened. That's where the beam comes from. So we got away from that source and got away from that light that centers. And that was God for me. And so, um, yeah, I was, I, I was, I was pleased that I realized that the road of reconstruction had not been done. So we got back to work, yeah. and it has been uh, amazing because, you know, uh, the world's crazy right now. I don't care if it's politics or the pandemic, all these different things. It was so incredibly stormy, and what I found was there's there's one ship. Um, or co there's a couple of ships. There's three. W work with me on this, Pete. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like Columbus took three ships, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Nina, the, Pina, the Nina, the Pina, the Pina, Pina Santa, Santa Maria, Maria to yeah. go to new places. And so I found three ships in the program, uh, the fellowship, um, the relationship, and the sponsorship that they have just centered me and, and, and taken me to new places. And so, yeah, I didn't respond initially well, but I'm, I'm thankful that, that, I, um, that I knew, like, and trusted this individual um, and, and got out of self and did the work and it's I'm in a, I'm I'm more um, centered and spiritually fit um, because of God and these and people a lot than I have been in, in forever. You walk into a room and you you light it up and you also lighten it up because you got a good sense of humor and you, it doesn't appear like you take yourself too seriously uh, and and that's hugely important. Before I let you go, uh, there's one thing I want you to share and I. You have, we have the promises in our program, right? But you have like a different version of those promises for when, for when somebody's drinking or using, right? You remember this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, <laughs> the promises in our program, that's, for me, that was the carrot stick, right? I heard that like a new freedom and new happiness and my whole outlook upon life would change. And recovery, you're thinking, man, that's awesome. I think it's important to remember why, why it's so hard. Why, why don't drink and go to meetings doesn't work. Because if it's, if it's that simple, we wouldn't need the program. If I could just don't drink no matter what, right? If I could just drink no matter what, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to AA. Why should I? You know, why should I? And so um, there's got to be more. But it's important to realize when I took that first drink, I drank one drink. My whole outlook upon life changed. <laughs> took another drink, um, you know, a new feeling of, of happiness and peace. Um, uh, take a couple of hydrocodones or Vicodin and uh, I would comprehend the word serenity and no peace. And then, <laughs> you know, three or four more, I'm buying rounds for the whole bar. My fear of people and economic insecurity left me. And then, um, you know, on and on and on later on, I show you how my experience could benefit others, but, but it worked that artificial, that artificial um, spirituality. It was artificial um, fueled by the alcohol and it worked. It worked. That's what makes it so hard to um, to give up is it worked you know when I drank I felt like they loved me more they appreciated me more they were paying me the right amount of money and I was I was significant I mattered no one's trying to get one over on me 
um, oftentimes um, when you take that alcohol away, life's there, man. And so you have to have a substitute that's more than adequate. You have to one that's not artificial. So I'm happy to report today by, by working the program in my life, the promises have come true, but they're not artificial. They're not artificial. They are there and, and they continue to be there as long as I do the work. Work equals reward. Anything else? No, I don't want you to ask me any more questions. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We've covered girls and family yeah. and everything else. So no, I, I just wanna, I wanna share with you, the work you're doing is amazing because what we cannot afford to do, um, you know, it's, it's an anonymous program that I'm part of. It's not a secret society. It was never designed to be. We have to be out there on the firing lines to say that, um, you know, through, through alcohol or drugs, um, you're not a mistake. Yeah. You made some mistakes, right? And I think that's the beauty of the program is, is realizing you're not a mistake. You made some mistakes. And, and then it's kind of like the – I'm out here now, Pete. It's kind of like yeah. Statue of David, right? Ask how he made the statue. And he said um, all he did was kind of chip away what the things that David wasn't, and the statue appeared. The program's a lot like that. It kind of helps you to identify – um, or, or to discover and discard the things that you're not or God doesn't want you to be. What, what, who we were when we were out there drinking and using was not who God designed us to be. And so it's getting rid of all that stuff. And the program has allowed me to, uh, to do that through my relationship with God and meeting amazing people that are, uh, are carrying this message to people who still suffer. Well, yeah, and, and I, this whole thing kind of came on my radar, just this idea. Just to give people, I don't think I've ever even talked about this, but I was... I was at home, it was July, right? My parents were away. I was in the grips of, of alcoholism like crazy, mm -hmm. right? Like my parents, I'm sure, thought a hundred times about leaving me alone at their house. I'm in my 30s. Um, I drink all the alcohol they have. I'm waking up in the morning, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking. I mean, that never had happened to me before, but it's happening, mm -hmm. I'm that guy. And uh, there was this, uh, I think it was a Sports Century Classic. ESPN used to do those, and I didn't love them. I've always loved documentaries. And Dennis Eckersley, the, the relief pitcher, mm -hmm. is sober. Um, and he talked about his journey. And I remember watching this and crying, being like, I gotta get, I gotta get there. Like, it just always... And I must have watched it like three or four times, watching it crying. And uh, no lie, like three or four times, mm -hmm. only like a half hour. But, uh, I mean, it, those seeds along the way were planted by people that were out there. And uh, I did have reflections of people or, or, or people connections with people like you and a buddy of mine, Peter F., who had gotten sober. So I saw that working too. But I just think it's important for people like you to share your story to, so they can see you, you know, living life like a loose vest today or a loose shirt, you know, and that's kind mm -hmm. of, you know, you don't have to get drunk to feel that way. Right. You know? Sun loud of the spirit. All right, you're the sunlight of the spirit today. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, my brother. All right, Mike. Thanks so much for listening to The Payoff with Pete. Once again, I'm Pete Souza, And of course, we are part of the Rogue Media Network. All kinds of good podcasts you can find at roguemedianetwork.com. And of course, you can find this podcast and all those other ones wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, other spots like that. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast.